Hello, everybody. Welcome to this quarter's Program Integrity Pulse Client Webinar. This is an SIU panel discussion and it's called Best Practices in Healthcare Payer FWA. I'm Warren Lesnevsky, Product Marketing Director here at Coactivity and your host for the next hour. So thank you so much for joining us. We are very pleased to open this webinar up to other health plans outside of our clients so that everybody can benefit from hearing from this experienced panel today. But before we get started, I wanna quickly run through some housekeeping items. First, you can resize all your windows that you currently see on your screen, including the slides and the presenter video. And we have multiple ways for you to reach out to us during the webinar. At the bottom, you'll see our ask a question box, which you can use to submit your questions at any point for our speakers. And I'd encourage you to submit your questions throughout so that uh, we can make sure to get to them. You can also use the email us button to request additional follow-up after today's webinar. And on the left, you'll find additional resources, including links to useful assets related to today's webinar. Click the image at the bottom right to learn more about some FWA schemes. Also, please take a moment at the, bottom, uh, at the point during um, today's webinar to answer uh, a quick survey. Your feedback is extremely valuable and it helps inform future topics. And then lastly, NHCAA will be offering one AHFI credit for this webinar available only to those who attend live today. An email with the attestation link will be provided to live attendees after the webinar. Okay, so we have a great panel of SIU directors with us today. Jennifer Putt, SIU Director at Highmark Home Care. Leticia Meir, Director of Financial Investigations at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. And Trevor McCall, Director of Special Investigations and Program Integrity at AmeriHealth Caritas. They will all introduce themselves a little more in just a moment. Our moderator today is Ryan Cleverly. As the Director of uh, Product, Fraud, Waste, and Abuse here, Ryan is responsible for the strategic direction of Coactivity's FWA product offerings, including both repay and post-pay detection. Ryan has extensive experience in creating and managing FWA detection products and is himself a former investigator. So Ryan, with that, I will hand it over to you and kick things off. Great, thanks Warren. Hey, welcome everyone. We're excited to have you join us today. Um, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're calling us from or joining us from. Um, we're excited to go through today's session. We're also excited to have the panel of guests that, that, that Warren just introduced and, and really cover um, a variety of topics here, but really what we want to make sure that as we go through um, and, and discuss these topics with our panel today, that you really have um, some, some information that's useful to you that you can take back as we go through some, some real world experiences, again, with our panel um, that are experts in this field. And we can go through and we're going to cover really, um, you know, as you see the topics here in front of you, um, how to really put an investigative work plan together. And, and how our, our team here does that within each of their own SIUs. Um, some of the case examples that we'll go through have to do with uh, really how to look at both um, combining provider level and, and claim level reviews and that, how that'll help really identify you know, more fraud, waste and abuse and, and even um, getting more of a holistic view of that provider's billing behavior. Um, also combining in there uh, both prepay and and postpay pattern abuse. So so we'll ask and, and discuss some of those within our with our panel today. Um, and and also going through a lot of the the stress and strain um, that our that our SIUs are facing today between um, hiring and retaining good talent, um, and then obviously leveraging and, and how to identify ROI. But before we get into that, we do have a few housekeeping items we just need to go through and cover. So I wanna go through our disclaimer real quickly uh, and, and just, we'll just read this. The contents of this presentation, both written and oral, are not to be construed in any way as legal advice. This presentation is for informational purposes only. The views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the official position of AmeriHealth Caritas, Blue Cross Blue Shield Louisiana, Highmark Whole Care, or Cotivity Inc. Okay, so we all know really the challenges that we face today. We know that FWA isn't going away. Um, we, we all know, we've all seen the numbers out there. We know that, you know, of total healthcare expenditure, about three, anywhere from 3% to 10% of that 
um, is lost to FWA, and really only about 8% is really ever recovered. Last year alone, you know, our, our here at Cotivity, our fraud waste and abuse management identified about $13 billion in suspect claims, really kind of looking across our entire hosted set of, of active medical and dental clients. So we know it's not going away. If anything, it's increasing. And now to add to that, we've just come out of a, out of a pandemic where things have changed. There's new schemes that we need to identify. There are um, issues with, with um, hiring and retaining talent. How do we fill in those needs? There's the, um, you know, we're coming out of what they are referring to as the, as the great resignation or the, the, the new term that's out there now, I believe is quiet quitting. So how are we facing those challenges? It's, it's adding more stress and more strain to our SIUs than ever before. So what we wanna do today, again, reiterating our key takeaways we just looked at in our objectives, um, really diving in, discussing with our panel these very things and, and really understanding how they're doing it and, and you know, as, as you watch and listen and, and ask questions, find ways that you can take that back into your, your SIU. So with that, I wanna introduce our first panelist. Excuse me. We'd like to introduce uh, Letitia Mir. Letitia, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself. All right. Thanks, Ryan. And like he said earlier, good morning and good afternoon, depend on, depending on what coast you're on. So I am Letitia Mir. I'm the director of the Financial Investigations Department here at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. I have been blue for about 26 years, so I've been here for quite some time and actually have spent all of that time within the SIU I originally started off doing a three month um, internship before my state police academy started and then Blue Cross offered me a permanent position, which has been a very good decision. So my three months has now turned into um, 26 years. So a little bit about Blue, our current enrollment is about 1.9 million members. Um, we have a wide variety of different products that we offer to include some of which Medicare Advantage, Exchange, FEP, individual products. Um, we're, since we're a blue plan, we process ITS um, claims, which means other blues members either receiving services from here within our state or our own members receiving services from another blue in another state. So our Financial Investigations Department was created in 1992, so long ago, um, the senior leader of the division knew that there was gonna be fraud, waste, and abuse, so created the unit. We are currently a dedicated team of 14, and we participate in a number of um, boards and organizations to make sure we keep our finger on the pulse of kind of what's going on in the fraud world because it changes on a daily basis. So thank you again, Cotivity, for having me. We've had um, a great relationship. Erin and her team has been wonderful and gracious and amenable to whatever our small little incremental budget that we have now. So some of the su successes that we have had with Cotivity. So we entered into a proof of concept in 21, 2021 and working on one in 2022. So the proof of concept, um, they generated leads on our behalf. And so based on those leads that they generated, we were able to open about a dozen or so cases and allegations. And from that, we have had significant financial impact um, for the company. Again, we are continuing to grow our relationship and look forward to where um, we can go in 2023 with hopefully the expansion of our budget. All right, back to you, Ryan. Great, thanks, Leticia. Looking forward to uh, hearing from you today. Uh, let's move to our next panelist, uh, Jennifer Putt. Jennifer, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Excited to uh, be part of the Cotivity uh, presentation and partnering with Cotivity unit at Highmark Cool Care. We are formerly known as Gateway Health Plan. Um, I have been with Highmark for almost uh, two and a half years. Um, before that, my uh, my experience spanned around working on the provider side for almost 20 years, um, where I worked on uh, the quality side and had various leadership and auditing roles. Um, my experience currently revolves around managing people and auditing specific to fraud, waste, or abuse and regulation enforcement. 
Um, so like I said, I had 20 years on the provider side and within the, within the last seven years, I have ventured over to the payer side and have held positions at other managed care organizations. A little bit um, about Highmark Whole Care. Our mission is to care for the whole person in all communities where the need is the greatest. We see a future in which everyone has equal opportunity to achieve their best health. Working along amazing colleagues and investigators, the Fraud, Waste, and Abuse team helps to fulfill that mission. Uh, the Highmark Pool Care FWA team has two divisions. We have the Special Investigations Unit and the FWA Solutions Team. Our team consists of 16 dedicated people, which includes coders and certified fraud examiners, uh, reporting uh, and compliance people, and a wealth of um, auditing experience from our dedicated team. Our team's goals are to detect, detect and investigate fraud, waste, and abuse and ensure that claims are paid correctly both by prepay and postpay auditing methods. Uh, the SIU team internally also oversees any administrative projects. We handle federal and state reporting and we collaborate with law enforcement for investigations and fraud referrals. Internally, we use Cotivity FWA management solutions. Uh, we use Commander. Um, which is our case management system, which is our, in air quotes, our source of truth. Um, we use it for all of our reporting measures. We are currently partnering with Cotivity on building out and adding in a, a section um, in Commander for our corrective action plans um, so that we can pull tracking and reporting for all of our incoming uh, corrective action plans. We use Sentinel to help vet our incoming cases. We are taking a deeper dive into informant and getting more familiar with informant and how it can um, help the SIU achieve, uh, team achieve uh, more referrals. And activities prepay solution, which we are really excited about um, here at the at Highmark Whole Care. I will throw it back to Ryan who can turn it over to Trevor now. Great, thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, and last but not least, uh, Trevor, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Hey, Trevor, you might be on, on mute. That's okay. Trevor, if uh, while you work through technical issues, just we'll we'll get back to you once we can hear you, if that's okay. All right. So I think what we'll do then is we'll go ahead and once Trevor's up, we can get Trevor's audio going. Trevor, is your audio going? No, we still can't hear you. I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and get started for just a minute here and, and see if we can't work on that behind the scenes, get this audio going, we'll come back to Trevor for just a minute. So I think what we'd, we'd like to do is just pivot for just a minute over into our discussion. And we, like we, we had mentioned, we have a great, a great panel here. Um, on the onset, we talked about a lot of the problems and the challenges that we run into. Um, we, we talked about resource issues and the constraints issues and just the new schemes that are surfacing due to the pandemic. So what I want to do is just start with Leticia for just a minute here. Can you really go through and just talk about two or three of the biggest issues that's really facing your, your organization and your SIU right now? Yeah, glad you said to limit it because obviously there's a, a lot of big challenges and things that we face, just not only from the pandemic, but just day to day dealing with people and providers and the whole fraud, waste and abuse world. So I would say right now, some of our biggest challenges, um, like everyone else is seeing, we have more cases, allegation, and administrative duties than we can seemingly keep up with. So it takes quite a bit of communication and prioritizing and determining what the biggest risks are to the company, not only on the fraud, waste, and abuse side, but as well as just all of the regulatory reporting um, as well to all of the different contractors um, that we have to initiate fraud, waste, and abuse efforts for. Um, another thing, like everyone has seen, is hiring and retaining great talent. Um, we'll definitely get into that a little bit more as to kind of what happened 
um, in 2021. Like you just said, with the great resignation, we definitely saw it at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. And so we have kind of put a lot of rigor around who do we want in our mix? How do we try to maintain those talented um, individuals? And then what to do um, once they're on boarded to keep them um, passionate about all the different things that we do. And lastly, just um, as I continue in my tenure here within the SIU, I see that the world as a whole is kind of more difficult. And so providers and other individuals that we deal with seem to be much more litigious than they were um, a decade or so ago. So that definitely gives us gives us some additional challenges to face on a day-to-day -day basis. Got it. Thanks, Leticia. So, so Jennifer, listening to what Leticia was just mentioning there, you know, she covered some some resourcing issues. How does your team also face those, you know, top two or three big challenges? Do yours seem to be similar in retention or training? Um, how did, what are the challenges you face? Yeah, I could almost uh, say my response was going to mirror Leticia's. Um, first off, the size and the workload of, of my team while retaining staff is is definitely a concern at this point. Um, we've we've faced a lot of challenges and some turnover, you know, during the Great Resignation. Um, our other big issue is identifying prepaid provide seven staff. Um, you know, obviously, we would rather catch the dollars up front than than miss them post pay. But with the small um, SIU team that we do have, um, that's definitely one of the challenges for us moving forward. Um, that's why we're excited to partner with Cotivity. Um, and then the other big thing that we um, really as a challenge for us is just identifying those smaller fraud cases that really truly focus on true red flag red flag flag fraud. Try to say that three times. Um, you know, we, we, we have investigations that and referrals that come in every single day and they really focus on, you know, the larger providers and the outliers and the utilizers. But, you know, we, when you get down to when you're pulling data and you're looking at your data mining, you know, you see those smaller providers on the bottom that you don't always necessarily get to hit because they don't hit that higher outlier. Um, so that's something that our team really would like to focus on. And um, we do plan to do that by, you know, re, re looking at our routine audits on an annual basis from prior years, um, you know, looking at corrective action plans, um, seeing where we need to go in and do some additional monitoring on those providers. Great, so thanks, Jennifer. Jobs. Yeah, thanks. great, thanks. So we've already gone through several challenges here and Trevor, I'm sure you you face a lot of those same challenges. So hopefully we've accomplished and, and beat one of those challenges, which is audio. So let's uh, let's see if, if hey, you get a chance to go ahead and introduce yourself and, and let's talk about some of the challenges you face. Hey, can you hear me now? Yeah, we've got you. Perfect. My apologies um, for that snafu. Uh, so the introduction, first and foremost, guys, I want to say hello to everybody out there. And if you're in the state of Florida, um, uh, I'll also with you as you brace for this hurricane being here in Louisiana something we know all too well. Um, so you know, I'll brace for that and, and good luck with everything that's going on in Florida. Um, Trevor McCall, as, as indicated previously, uh, I've been investigating healthcare for all waste and abuse around over a little 20 years. I uh, got my start a long time ago working with the state of Louisiana with the Department of Insurance, uh, where I was uh, rose to the rank of director there before transitioning to the Medicaid for All Control Unit, uh, where I worked there and ultimately left in 2018 to venture to the private side. I have an amazing job here at Maryland Care Times, starting off as an investigator and now sitting in the director's seat. I had a stand at Anthem, I mean, at Elevance Health, an amazing uh, MCO as well, uh, partnering there to work over the Arkansas, Iowa, and Virginia markets. Uh, here at AmeriHealth, we offer Medicaid products, Medicare, uh, DSNP, LTSS programs, the exchange, uh, behavioral health, uh, to a little over 5.2 million members in total. Um, our mission here is to put hair at the heart of everything that we do here at AmeriHealth. Uh, we believe that everyone is equal, should be treated equally and fairly, and that's something that AmeriHealth Caritas embodies on a daily basis. Uh, my unit is comprised of 70 total employees, around four different teams, investigations team, my data analytics team, intake, and our clinical and medical coding team. Um, everyone here, we have credentials everywhere from the AFI to the CFE, CPC, LMSWs, RNs, 
uh, you name it, we have it. Um, we like to have a, a, a great deal of expertise here in house. Um, uh, challenges that we face. So and let me backtrack. Some of the products that we utilize with Cotivity, uh, we could utilize uh, Stars Informant. Informant is our um, the tool, our tool that we will utilize to better go through the system and, and have our data housed there. We'll use Sentinel for the flags. And those flags will be utilized to drive our cases and our investigator utilize, utilize that for the data mining that they're doing on a daily basis. And Commander is our source of truth. We use that on a, a daily basis to keep track of our systems, our financial recoveries, and, and things like that. So we've enjoyed a, a very long, a robust partnership with Cotivity. And we seem to, uh, everyone seems to be happy with that relationship, and we hope to, you know, continues going forward. Challenges that we face, uh, much like my partners indicated previously, we, we're, we're no different from where they are. Uh, some of the challenges that I can think that that we face here, uh, not only is, uh, of course, with the great resignation, as Ryan alluded to earlier, um, but with some of the, the mandates that came down from the 21st Century Cures Act with the EVV portal. EVV is a tremendous tool when it's deployed properly. But in the event that you have uh, some providers who want to go in and have those manual entries as opposed to the entries that are electronic in nature that will capture the location of the employee at the home of the resident, as opposed to them doing it manually. Uh, manual entries don't allow for the tracking of the uh, the member or the employee, so they might clock in, you know, clock the associate in manually, and they're somewhere across town not providing care to our members. And it's going to hard to track those types of providers and that provider type, which is the LTSS provider population. Um, it's hard to, to track those because you don't have any identifiers in the system, so they don't. We don't want to track via socials. Uh, we know hackers are waiting just around the corner to to put their hand on steal any data that they can. Those the majority of those workers don't have MPI numbers, so we can't track them that way. So what we have to do is, I think that if we have providers that are utilizing that system inappropriately, uh, manually clocking in those associates over so many times, hold those claims, flag them, conduct interviews and make a determination as to whether or not those services were rendered. Um, that's one of the challenges that we face. And also some of the reporting in the, the various markets. Every market that we, we do business in, every LOB, has a different reporting structure. And so when you when you have that, and as, and as well as with new business, you have to build new templates, or the templates come from the market, and you have to make sure that your case tracking system can spit the data out of, you know, properly and appropriately to get it to the regulators for review. And so those are some of the challenges that we face with reporting as every market, of course, will uh, will be different. And, and lastly, we've seen a lot of providers who decided to close their doors once we determined that we've identified an overpayment and we wanted to go and collect our money. So a lot of them will throw their hands up and say, okay, I give up, I quit. Um, and what we do in that instance, of course, is we do try to recover the funds, but most importantly, we track our members. If you are actually providing those services to our members and you decide to close, our members aren't going to stop needing those services then. So we track our members to see exactly if we can find a link to another provider. We find that providers like to sell their book of business to another entity so they can start to build on our members. And we try to find a common link so that we can, at that point in time, go full and investigate that provider as well. So, um, Sorry for the technical issues before, um, and I'll throw it back to you, Ryan. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Trevor. Appreciate that, and uh, glad we get the technical issues worked out. So um, just listening to the three of you discuss a lot of the challenges you face, one of the common themes that we're hearing here has to do with um, resources and retention um, and training. So what I wanted to just quickly do was, Latisha, I wanted to ask you, so you specifically mentioned you know, staff retention. Um, you, we, we talked about the great resignation a little bit. So that's definitely one of the factors here, but how are you navigating through specifically recruiting, training, and then just retaining, you know, your FWE, F, excuse me, FWA SMEs? Yeah, so like I mentioned a little bit earlier, as if just dealing with the pandemic wasn't enough, then we definitely saw and felt um, the great resignation as well. But I'll back up a little bit. So for my first 21 years, I had the same boss for that entirety of, of time. And then he was um, promoted up to our senior management level. Um, so since that time, I have gone through a number of different vice presidents. So beginning, um, so the pandemic started in 2020, I've received a new vice president in mid, um, 
mid 2020. So that was a whole new um, bucket of fun. So to add on top of that, um, with her support, she is outstanding and she she definitely is 100 percent supportive of what we do and she wants to hold people accountable. So she knew that we I was really spread too thin because at that time I really had eight direct reports. And so we decided that we needed to do some reorg um, within our department. So in mid 2021, again, on top of the pandemic, I was able to actually promote two with two people already existing in our department to a management level position. So that way we kind of now have three different um, pillars within the financial investigations department, which really helps me to only have three direct reports. So on one side of the house, I have um, Alan Lofton. He does all of our commercial, our different ASO products, um, FEP and all things that look like that. On the other side of the house, I have Candace Coward. So she's over Medicare Advantage, the exchange, um, and some other different products that, as everyone knows, has a lot of rigor around all of the regulatory reporting and if you're audited, what needs to go on the universe. And then in the middle, we are fortunate enough to have a designated informatics team because fraud, waste, and abuse changes on a daily basis. And so having that implanted informatics team within the SIU, we can build what we need to build, we can change what we need to change. And then that way, we can definitely keep um, a closer look at really a prepay effort versus a postpay, like a few people have already um, mentioned. So with that um, reorg, and actually, I think what our SIU looks like now really looks like um, some other SIUs, because during that process, I reached out to my peers to kind of get some best practices. So going back to your specific question, to try to keep good talent, and we did, um, like I said, we had a lot of turnover in 2021, but in hindsight, it was actually a very positive change. And now we have really an extraordinary mix of individuals that have coding backgrounds. We have a, a number of um, nurses on our staff. We have an, an analytical full team that they're really the hub and spoke of what we do. They take in everything, they look at it, they triage it, and they're, they're, they're the push out team and they decide where it needs to go. So to help, once we have people onboarded and to help people stay enthusiastic and passionate about what we do, because obviously we're we're here for a paycheck and, and not only do we love what we do, but also people like some time away from the office. So just some little things that we do for out of the box um, outcomes, initiatives, um, and any type of leadership things, we give them star days. So if they do something kind of out of the box or whatever, we'll give them an extra half a day, a whole day, because that really helps with just balancing out all of the work-life balance. Um, we are very flexible. As long as the job's getting done, we're very flexible um, with all of the, their needs to handle their personal life. Um, based on the, um, the level of turnover, management completely did an overhaul of our training and we took really that back in house and we got things into one repository looked at our checklist, looked at the different things, and really the timing of once we onboard someone, what do they need to know first, second to 50th? Because ingesting all of this information is, is quite overwhelming. So we really have a better training, um, which has now given us a much better output of people handling cases and getting them to be able to handle things more independently. Um, that also helps with, I wasn't ever trained on that. I wasn't ever given that specific information. So we have, again, some specific checklists of when we covered certain things and that helps for them to know, oh yeah, I did, I did receive that particular training. Let me go find it myself. I just recently had a conversation with one of my um, employees and we are, I guess, probably sometimes at a better advantage being a smaller SIU that I can actually reach out to a couple levels down to get a finger on the pulse and kind of do some check-ins. And so this is our newest employee. And she said, really from an employee standpoint that they need to be accountable, be a self-starter, that obviously your manager doesn't know what you're lacking or what maybe there's some opportunity. So it's really incumbent upon each person to have full communication and reach out whenever there's a need because managers, obviously, we, we can't know everything that someone um, needs at different times. 
And lastly, one of the things that we do, and thankfully um, we can now do things in person that we recently started to have team building um, sessions in person. We try to get, go out and celebrate um, birthdays and anniversaries on a monthly basis. And so putting some fun back into the work world, especially with all of the negative that we typically have to deal with, to me is key to keeping people happy um, and, and moving along with what we need to do. Great, great. Thanks, Letitia. Um, I want to pivot over to, to you, Jennifer. So Letitia mentioned a few items like the, um, you know, being more flexible and, and revamping their training. What what have you done in your organization to, to really kind of help with that retention and training and just expanding on, on the, the vascular skill set? Yes. Um, it's funny, Letitia, everything you say, I feel like I could just mirror you and piggyback off of it. Um, you know, what I've learned over the last year is the only consistent in life is change. Um, we on the Highmark Cool Care side have experienced a lot of change recently, and we will experience more change as we become fully integrated with Highmark Health. So we're going from a small team of 16 to, I learned yesterday, I think in our ERNG Enterprise Risk and Governance team that we are being um, incorporated into has 500 employees. So um, from a small, tiny SIU to, you know, uh, to a bigger department. So, um, but we have experienced some resignations over the last year. Um, internally, the first thing we did was we did re re revamp our onboarding training. Um, we we want to encourage growth and development through industry trainings. Um, and we've also really been pushing our staff to be, to get their CFE to become certified fraud examiners. Um, we wanna see that growth and development internally to be able to retain the staff and keep them here and show them that we believe in them and we want to watch them grow and put the money in to watch them grow. Um, work from home has definitely changed the scope of day-to-day -day functions. Um, you know, we try to use team chats on a daily basis. Every Monday morning, we have a Monday morning huddle um, where we gather together as a team to kind of plan uh, the week and talk about um, high priority cases that really need the focus for that week. Um, we also monthly host an all associate team meeting, which brings together the SIU team and the FWA solutions team. So we're highlight team and individual recognitions, um, you know, while uniting the team together. We also use this meeting to help us stay on the pulse of our FWA activities and provide industry and internal updates. Um, like Letitia's team, we've also focused on celebrating each other's compliment, accomplishments and gathering more together. Um, we held an end of summer picnic, which was a great time. Um, we've had some team building actually on site um, in the office, which was great because it also helped us bring together the new staff with the old staff and everybody, you know, really got to form a bond as a team. Um, and then we also offer volunteer days uh, here at Highmark Cool Care, and we really focus on volunteering and doing good for the community. Um, and we really try to do that together as a team. Um, it's another great way to just build the team together and keep us cohesive as one. Great, thanks, Jennifer. So, so listening to Letitia and Jennifer, Trevor, it, it really kind of sounds like there's there's been a little bit of a culture change in how you have to approach um, this this specific issue or this specific problem. What are things that your organization has also done just from that standpoint? Even hey, yeah, and and great. You know, my colleagues have have indicated and said some of the things that we do here, um, but Ryan, you hit the nail on the head, and it's about culture change. Uh, whenever we went, when we, the pandemic uh, came, we all were forced to work from home. Everyone had to adjust and pivot pretty quickly. So we went from having those monthly water cooler uh, conversation or daily water cooler conversations and birthday cakes and things like that to celebrating those things virtually. But I think that also gave us an opportunity to, to be uh, better humans, better, better, uh, better business partners and better friends. And so some of the things that we do here at Ameri Health Caritas for that is, again, the, the culture shift. Uh, I have a total of 16 direct reports, uh, very daunting, but I ensure that I have, I give each one of my direct reports as much one-on-one uh, -on -one time as I possibly can by attending to them there, one of the meetings that they'll have with their teams. I'll ensure that when their birthdays that need to be celebrated, our managers do a great job of communicating that out to the entire special investigations unit team. 
we recognize each other's accomplishments therein. Um, it's letting people know that there's an open door communication policy with me. I don't feel as if I'm, I'm above having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with anyone from our intake specialist all the way to one of my more senior managers. And so I think letting people know that they matter to you is the, the big, biggest part of the culture sh cultural shift here. Uh, another thing that I do periodically, I travel to our home office in Philadelphia. And while I'm there, I'll invite the staff members to the office. Uh, we'll, we'll have lunch together. We'll, we'll have different conversations, training sessions, and go over things that we might be able to solution better sitting at a table as opposed to uh, on Zoom or whatever the case may be. So um, those are just a couple of the things that we do. But as far as training with new associates, we've developed a robust training program so that whenever we have new associates, we have some pre-recorded training videos that they can utilize as well as utilize their manager and a mentor so that when they first come to the company, within the first 60 to 90 days, they're going to have somebody there with them every step of the way so that they can ensure that we can ensure that they have all of the training that they need, any questions that they have, no matter what it might be. We're, we're there to answer those questions with those associates. Uh, Ryan, we also have something called a continuous improvement log. Um, all, our, all of our associates are tasked with going in the continuous improvement log on a regular basis and submitting ideas for us to take back to, to the management team to review and determine what might be a, a new a process improvement and things that we can bring to the team. And uh, working with a, a, such a tremendous group of investigators and managers, we get some pretty uh, pretty great ideas and a lot of things that we actually put in place that the investigators themselves want to see happen here. And, uh, and lastly, the trainings. We have a lot of corporate initiatives. Uh, just this week right now, we're going through uh, Fraud Prevention Week in Pennsylvania. And so I have my managers and investigative team are uh, presenting there to the other associates as we're in, uh, within the company. So again, by just giving everyone uh, an idea of what we do within the SIU, because a lot of individuals say, well, what does the SIU team do? It seems as if it's so secretive and no one knows what you all do. By giving them a glimpse into what we do, uh, pulling the curtain back a little bit to let you know exactly what the SIU means to you and how you can assist us in our effort. And I think that's how we've been able to retain a lot of our staff um, since the pandemic hit. Great. Thank, thanks, Trevor. I think that there's some great advice there. Um, I'd like to, to just pivot for just a moment and really kind of switch over to some of the hot topics of, of cases or things that you're seeing. So, Letitia, I want to start with you. And, and really just kind of understanding, you know, that these hot topics like laboratories or DME suppliers and, and behavioral health are typically really kind of on the forefront of our, of, you know, especially our clients' minds. Um, where would you say your team is focusing the most attention in 2022? And, and can you give really just, you know, a high level success story or something related to scheme you know, the, really that our, our attendees can take back and really help in their investigative initiatives? Absolutely. So we definitely have um, lab cases, DME cases. So I'll touch on um, a couple of different things. So I'll start with lab. So um, during whenever the pandemic first started, really kind of all the COVID tests and things like that were really a don't touch it until we kind of understand a little bit better because the last thing we wanted to do was to stop a claim and review it for really for something that the, that the, the member really wanted. So one of the hot topics as we progressed along that really came to light in 2021 is where we saw that there was a couple of labs, more than a couple, probably a handful of labs that really kind of popped to the top um, regarding COVID testing. So whenever we looked into the data, we saw where people were being tested on a regular cadence. And so we reached out to those particular groups and we reached out to those particular members and what we found for the most part is a lot of them worked for um, nursing home um, groups which were also a group of ours as well and so they were they were had to do surveillance testing or return to work occupational testing week after week after week so we actually issued refund request letters to a number of different labs and we actually we're, we're successful in recovering. Um, right now, we're at about two and a half million in recoveries um, from those surveillance type return to work testing services because those are those are not covered by um, group by their health insurance. Um, another thing that really is kind of an old scheme but came to light was hemophilia um, group eligibility cases. So we found a couple of different groups 
that had members that resided outside of the state that really the the group did not really reside here or have a, a brick and mortar or footprint here as well. So we worked very closely with our legal team and marketing team just to make sure if there was any blowback that everyone that needed to be involved was involved. And we successfully terminated those groups early on um, in mid, uh, I think we terminated them in 2022. So that was really a great effort, which helped save millions of dollars, because if you've ever dealt with hemophilia claims, they're quite costly. Um, another thing that we're spending quite a bit of time on, um, we see where pro some provisionally licensed professional counsel counselors are rendering services, but all of the services are being filed under an LPC, a licensed professional counselor. So we're spending quite a bit of time um, on that as well and having great successes. Like a couple of people mentioned, which I guess I'm I'm lucky to get to go first because we it's good to hear that we are all are doing very similar um, things. But we have quite a number of prepay measures in place. We have daily reports that come to us um, that give us different red flags to look for, and we have different types of schemes and providers that hit our monitor and precision reports. And just on those small prepay efforts. Um, one of our informatics analysts has actually successfully stopped um, almost $2 million this year from going out the door. So that's a really great success for our department. Um, another thing that we do where we combine some provider level reviews as well as claim level reviews that like a couple of people have mentioned and like I just mentioned prepay efforts that if we see something that's just not right, we need to stop it on the front end because trying to chase those dollars is you're, you're not going to be able to be as successful um, with those efforts and it's usually a longer effort. So one of the successes that we saw, it was really during the UDT cases where other blues were processing claims, but we knew that those claims really were not payable based on a number of different things, just benefits alone that we have certain rules in place to pay for confirmatory tests. So we actually put some prepay edits in place for even claims coming in um, from out of state. So those are just a couple of the um, success stories that we've had um, in late 2021 and 2022. Great, <clears throat> thanks Leticia. So some of those things that you mentioned about hemophilia and some of the other schemes, you know, it sounds like there was some, some success recovering or even just identifying finding those. So, so Jennifer, Based on some of those things that Leticia just talked about, what schemes really have, have you been dealing with in your organization? Has, has there been anything related to, to DMEs or even COVID, COVID schemes, you know, coming out of the pandemic? What have you seen in those areas? Sure, Ryan, right. yeah. Uh, as part of our routine audits this year, we are focusing in on DMEs. Um, you know, CMS obviously identified DME as a high risk for 2022. We have identified our top outliers and utilizers. Um, we are focusing in on um, oxygenators. It's so hard to just pull DME data and say you're going to focus on everything because you'll just pull your hair out. So we had to definitely scale down and limit down to what we were specifically looking at for these DME reviews. Um, but what we're finding across the board is a higher error rate, um, you know, a lot of no uh, recertification letters uh, supporting medical necessity for the equipment, and a lot of no OS. Um, so close to $1 million in recoveries right now, um, specific to DME. Um, and of course, you know, law referral reforce, law enforcement referrals have been made. Um, ongoing monitoring of COVID. I think everybody's still focusing in on COVID. Um, hopefully this time next year, we never have to utter the word COVID again. Um, and I'm not going to hold my breath. <laughs> um, so, you know, still focusing in on those high volume providers, high volume members. Um, what we've been doing is monitoring the over-the-counter test kits just to see um, how the pharmacy supplies are going in and out um, because there is a limit of eight per month. So we've been looking at that, um, looking at place of service, um, and specifically um, targeting out-of-state labs, um, data mining to identify those out-of-state labs, um, use of member verifications to confirm testing and sites, where they actually got their COVID test and, um, you know, using social media to do some um, exploration into these labs, um, identifying their locations. Um, we actually found one that really wasn't a true location. 
um, and we had a considerable take back. So I, you know, true COVID, I don't think it'll ever go away anytime soon, but we're still, you know, still monitoring and still focusing in on those recoveries. Um, the last one that I would like to talk about today is something specific um, to a pain management clinic. Um, we are monitoring pain management clinics and uh, we were looking for um, a provider who was billing um, CPT code 99484, which is a behavioral health code. Um, this code is not included on the provider's fee schedule. Um, so we identified one provider whose documentation does not support the code bill. Um, the analyst worked with our configuration department to implement a system edit to deny for 99484 for payment. Um, so we're definitely seeing recoveries of close to 200K um, and savings for Medicare and Medicaid up, up to $60,000 for the first year. Um, you know, this code is specific to behavioral health integration and their specific service components that you have to have to build this code. Um, and when we pulled data mining, like I said, we had a provider, provider X is who I'll call them, who was definitely our outlier that submitted claims um, for this code. Um, and for this code, these members have to have a specific diagnosis related to behavioral health. Um, provider, stood, provider X stood out because they were a pain management provider and that they were billing for this code without the appropriate diagnoses. So the majority of the diagnoses were opi opioid dependence on complicated and pain management. So, um, you know, looking at the records, we found no description of the psychological factor needed to support this code in the medical records. So to date, um, you know, we've, we've had a lot of great recoveries and a lot of savings, um, just, you know, implementing that uh, edit to stop that code. Great. So that's Jennifer, a couple. thank you. Oh, did you have, sorry, did you have a few more? No, nope, that was it. I okay. was just going to pass it back to you, Ryan. Great, great. Thanks, Jennifer. So, so Trevor, <laughs> Jennifer was, was talking to us, so she was highlighting some specific codes. So I wanted just to ask you, are there any specific codes or just excessive billing of codes that, that you tend to see more within um, within your plan? Um, yeah, some of the ones, the same uh, codes that my partners mentioned, we, we've had a lot of providers who are outlawed for the uh, 99215s. Uh, matter of fact, one of the um, one of our uh, the cases that we work with actually came from a lead generation tool uh, developed by Cotivity, where it was a provider who was an outlaw for that code, as well as 80307. Um, that indicated the lab drug screening code. So we, uh, one of the investigators received that case and started to do some background checks on that matter and, and conducted some uh, member interviews as well as staff interviews. Um, so the, the lead came in indicating that we had an, they were an outlier for that. They indicated that they had the lab equipment to perform those tests and all of the claims that they submitted over a 12-month period indicated that they conducted the test and they billed for that 80307 uh, code. We contacted some of the, the, uh, the staff there, and they said, well, yeah, we have the machine, but we haven't used it in well over a year. We utilized the, the traditional, the, the cup method for the urinary drug testing, so we're not utilizing that machine at all. And then we also contacted the vendor where the provider leased the machine from, and they indicated that they have the machine. Um, they are clear certified to have the used machine, and, but they pay for it on a per test basis. And again, no tests have been run through that machine in over a year. Um, so we received medical records, conducted the review, which was opened in a 100% error rate, and sent the provider an overpayment letter and indicated that indicated we we're going to place them on PPR. And the provider said, you know what, I quit, threw their hands up, and decided to exit the network, but they still repaid uh, the overpayment a little bit over $28,000. And the provider subsequently, they left the network, but then they tried to come back, um, and that's still under review. So that's just a couple of the codes we're looking at. And we, we do have uh, a lot of uh, pharmacy related matters we look at, one of which involved a provider, a prescriber, who was uh, an outlaw for prescribing Latuda. But when the investigator received the, the invoice, the invoices and they contacted the wholesaler, that provider had not purchased, they some sort of pharmacists hadn't purchased any Latuda. So we we're trying to determine where they were getting the drugs, they were submitting the claims for reimbursement, uh, which the provider, the pharmacist was paid a little over $7 million for that. For the, for the tutor with the next closest pharmacy receiving around $600,000. Uh, so they, uh, my team conducted a claims analysis where we saw one member received, uh, indicated they received multiple strengths of the tutor with each prescription having five refills. Um, they were continuously filled. 
while they're sipping and receive, you know, another prescription each and every time. And so the we looked at one recipient and each of those previous prescriptions should have been canceled when a higher dose was prescribed, but they weren't. And the pharmacist received around $30,000 just off of that one member. We requested records, we reviewed the records, made the determination that some of the members, uh, unfortunately, were in uh, cahoots with the pharmacist to trade some of the Latuta for Razopam, and, and uh, that scheme was uncovered, and we ultimately submitted a overpayment letter to the pharmacist a little over $7 million, and uh, they submitted some documentation for rebuttal, but it's, term, it's currently on undergoing review. But um, so those are just a few of the high, uh, higher matters that we're looking at, but um, the same scheme still, where their ugly heads and possible day scenarios, providers are submitting behavioral health claims in excess of 96 units a day, which we know is impossible. Um, and then you can reach out to the, some of the members and they'll say, hey, I've never heard of this provider. I've never had any of those services. So those are just a few of the things that we're looking at here at America. Great, great. Thanks, Trevor. So we're seeing that we're getting a lot of very good questions here, and we want to make sure that we have some time. But there's one more topic I just wanted to quickly get to. So if each of you could maybe just take a just take a minute, because um, all of you mentioned SIU workloads as a major challenge. So given these resource constraints, right, there's the use of telehealth and and you know the remote nature of conducting our business, all of that has increased. You know, what are some of the best practices? that we can kind of recommend back to our, our um, attendees for, for, for uh, helping navigate through those challenges? And what are some things that they can use to really kind of use the, the right way to focus that attention and the right projects to help really increase fraud prevention? So, so with that, I'm gonna go in reverse order this time. And Trevor, let's start with you. Yeah, so coming off mute. Well, some of the things that I think we can do to, to combat FWA here in, in this arena is um, one of the first things nowadays is uh, we're getting back out into the world, but more on-site. Uh, let's get back out into the community. Let's start conducting more on-site visits to uh, see if some of those services are actually rendered and go and get the documentation on-site and have those those documents reviewed. Uh, another thing that I think that we can do to, to bolster our FWA efforts and ensure that we're looking at the right matters and not just any matter that comes across our desk, but also to have more collaborative trainings with our internal departments. Uh, you'll, you'll have your UM team and your, uh, your PNM teams that's going to collaborate with them a little bit more to determine if there are any areas that they're seeing in their arena that we can possibly uh, utilize and review here in our FWA, our FWA space. Um, and lastly, expand the use of uh, prepay review. I think that's... Uh, the, the most the, an awesome tool that we have, and I think that as long as we were to continue to bolster that and utilize that as our, uh, uh, stop the pay and chase model, I think that's the the, the best way that we can combat FWA. All right, thanks, Ryan. Right. Great, thanks, thanks, Trevor. Uh, Jennifer, you might mind. Sure. Um, something new for us um, is on sites. Um, we, uh, as a small SIU unit, have not uh, done on sites. Um, so our goal is to uh, conduct at least one on-site by the end of 2022. So I definitely um, agree with with Trevor and getting back out there and being a presence in the provider community and just conducting those on-sites. Um, I came from an MCO where we, we did all of our audits on-site. So I'm excited to build that training opportunity with my team. Um, and get them out into the field and, and have them experience that firsthand. So, so definitely on sites. Um, we use our annual work plan. It's our roadmap for the year for our routine audits, um, for any administrative projects that we have. Um, it really guides our course um, for the year. Um, we have a great process that includes intake triage and opportunities where we prioritize incoming cases um, and we vet them and we redirect any of those non-FWA concerns to those outer departments. Um, and then that also gives us the opportunity um, to keep in contact with those departments and work with them um, and help them, you know, get the answers that they need to address those non-FWA concerns. Um, we meet weekly um, during our triage and opportunities team um, to talk about internal and external referrals. Uh, we use various platforms or resource repositories to vet any at-risk physicians um, and to really push our cases. Um, and then 
You know, lastly, obviously the use of Commander, our case management system, um, it helps us prioritize our cases. Um, our goal is to open and close a case within 210 days. Um, dashboards in, in uh, Commander give us the opportunity to track those cases and see where we're at moving through uh, for, for the analyst to, to monitor that. Um, and then we also take a big stand um, with our BPI, our DHS um, BPI, Bureau of Program Integrity here in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, we have been leading and participating in our quarterly BPI meetings. Um, it's exciting. We're actually leading one this week on Thursday. Um, and it's, it's good to take part with the other MCOs um, in the region and to talk about cases and to, to really give us um, new referrals and, and ways to help us keep moving our SIU investigations and audits. Right, great. Jennifer, thank you. Leticia, just uh, real quickly here, some of the ways that you work through these major challenges. Yeah, so like, like um, Jennifer and Trevor both mentioned, we are definitely a proponent of on-site reviews. I mean, those are some of the best intelligence that, that we can ever get. And we make sure that we leave business cards with various people in the office. And so that way, if someone's uncomfortable to obviously say something while we're there, they have the wherewithal to be able to contact the investigator afterwards, which has actually happened quite a number of times and led to successful fraud cases. Another thing um, that I'll mention is that our big focus in 2022 is actually doing some very specific departmental meet and greets because it's been so long. And so people have kind of forgotten how, who we are, what we do, how to get matters to us. And so we've spent um, a lot of time in 2022 just getting back in front of all of the employees to make sure that they know how to get um, information to us. And if they see something, say something, um, get it to us more quickly than not. And lastly, I'll just mention that to help break down the silos here at Blue, we have a couple of different groups that spans um, various departments. So one is the medical cost work group. So it's typically VPs, directors, and managers, where we talk about a variety of issues, spikes and trends and things that the different groups are seeing. And then really someone takes um, accountability for a particular topic to kind of run it down to see if there's any type of savings or initiatives that can be taken out of that. And then that really overflows to MAP, the Medical Action Committee, Planning Committee. And so that's a higher level of senior management representatives that really hears all of the different things that the various departments are doing. So that way they, it, they can bring it forth and, and if there needs to be something that needs to be highlighted or uh, moved up in the hierarchy, then we have their, their ears as well. Great, great. Leticia, Jennifer, Trevor, thank you so much. Warren, I know that we have a, a number of questions that have come through and we can try to get through some of these, you know, as many as we can with our panel. So I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Ryan, and to our panelists. I mean, a lot of great stuff here. I'm sure we could talk for another hour, easy, on all this good stuff. We have about three minutes. We will definitely not get to all the great questions. So what we will try and do to our best ability is, um, answer you individually through email uh, after this is over. So, I, you know, I'm probably only have time for the one question. I'm just gonna go in order. The one of the first ones we received uh, is specifically to you, Jennifer. Um, and that is uh, when you mentioned that you were excited about um, looking at, at prepaid detection, uh, whole care, um, what are some of the top factors that energized uh, that move in that direction towards more prepaid. Sure, thanks, Warren. Um, honestly, uh, we had a really good uh, collaboration with Cotivity. Um, they are a great partner and they have really helped guide us. Um, and we've really talked about the, the prepaid portion that we're missing out on um, because we're not able to really kind of take the deeper dive into the data mining that we need to do to identify these providers. So um, with the new solution that we are working on implementing, um, that's gonna be a big focus, um, is helping us you know, identify those drivers, those providers, the, that data mining piece of it that we can't do um, to really help us identify uh, those outliers for us in, in the data, and then to also help assist us uh, with our prepaid review since we are a smaller special investigations unit. Okay, thank you so much for that. Really appreciate that. So 
Yes, unfortunately, that uh, that does conclude today's webinar. So, like I said, we will do our very best to get back to each of you uh, and, and your great questions. Um, some of them were specifically to our panelists. So, um, look forward to that. Also, then uh, look forward to getting our email uh, shortly. We'll have the link to the uh, on-demand recording to this webinar, and we'll have the uh, link to the attestation so that you can get your AFI. And um, we appreciate everyone's time and attention today. Thank you so much. I'm Warren Lesnevsky, and we'll talk to you next time.